Yeah, I know that we have with us, if you would put your hands together and welcome our uh, explorers from the Baltimore City Police Department, Southern District. These young people joined the mayor and the police commissioner uh, and members from the fire department this weekend as we canvassed in the Southern District. And uh, they will be uh, facilitating the Pledge of Allegiance in just a moment. Um, before we get started, I would like to welcome Pastor Eaton, who will offer, is Pastor Eaton uh, in the room? Yeah. Pastor, if you would join us on the stage. As Pastor comes to offer an invocation, I would like to welcome, well certainly I'm not welcoming, would present to you uh, Dr. Mark Maurer, President of the Federation of the Blind here in Baltimore. Thank you very much, Gus. I appreciate that, and I would want to offer also my welcome to all of you here to the National Federation of the Blind Jernigan Institute, which is our headquarters building for the National Federation of the Blind. It's a nationwide organization. And I want to say this to you, Gus. I appreciate what you said because you called us the National Federation of the Blind. A lot of people call us the National Federation for the Blind, and uh, what we're doing is running an organization that's made up of blind people. Lots of folks think, how can I ever employ a blind person? Do I want somebody who's blind on my staff? Well, we know we want blind people on our staff, so we take all the blind people in America who want to join the National Federation of the Blind, and we make progress here. We build opportunities for blind adults and blind children. We teach kids how to do science and engineering and mathematics. And we teach adults how to live productive lives in this building. And we're an organization made up of blind people. We want to welcome you here because we love the neighborhood. We love to be good neighbors. We want to have people come and join each other here. Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake has been here before. I never know exactly how to call you. It, uh, is it polite to say Madam Mayor or something? But anyway, uh, you've been here before and it's great to welcome you back. We had a debate here during the campaign. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about something else. We're, we're pleased, very pleased to have the police commissioner here. We have worked with Butterbean and his colleagues for <laughs> 10 years or so. and. Uh, I even asked him why he's known as Butterbean, and he came here one time and he was, played Santa Claus for us, for the blind kids who come here, and in other words, this has been a great uh, partnership, and I'm glad to have you back. And I appreciate also having our fire chief who has come. We hope to have the safest building in town. And uh, we're always glad to have advice from you about how to make sure it is. We're not talking about our work tonight. We're talking about this community and how to make it a better community. And I know that our mayor and our police commissioner and our fire chief are going to help us do that. And we want to be partners in the process. But we also want you to know that if you have an event and you want to hold it here, please come back. This is a great place to be. We do a lot of good work here. And we'd like to work with our partners in the community in doing it. Thanks for coming. Again, Pastor Norman Eaton. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, even now, oh God, we just want to take this opportunity to thank you. We want to thank you, oh God, for your grace, your mercy, and your love. We thank you, O oh God, for all those that have assembled themselves here even on this evening. We thank you, O oh God, for those that are here. O oh God, we thank you for the leadership of this city. We thank you, O oh God, for Southern District. We thank you, O oh God, because right now we're coming together not just to make it better, but, Lord, we want to make it the best. We ask even now, O oh God, that you continue to lead us and guide us, O oh God. Continue to be with us. Be with our families, O oh God. 
be with, oh God, the Southern District Police Station, be with every leader that is here, oh God, in their respective places. We ask these things, oh God, of you because we know that you can and we know that you will. So God, have your way even right now in this place. Let all things be done, oh God, according to your will and your grace and mercy. Amen. 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 We'll now be led by the explorers in the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's give them a hand again. I would like to now, certainly he needs no introduction in this district. He joined us on Saturday as we went out canvassing in Cherry Hill, uh, inviting folks out to tonight's event. I would like to present to you Mr. Jack Baker, president of the Southern District CRC. Hello, Southern District. Hello. Thank you. I could hear that. <laughs> Madam Mayor, can we have about two minutes of your program to give an award to Officer of the Month? Okay. Major, where's our Major? Here he comes. Uh, most of these faces here are familiar for those of you that are new to a meeting like this. Every month we award one of the fine officers from the Southern District an Officer of the Month Award. Uh, this month is a little bit different. Um, this is an award that was due to this officer actually several months ago, um, but he couldn't receive it the particular night because he, was, he wasn't at work. Um, he, was, he was on a day off. Um, but the, the <clears throat> work and the bravery of this officer on a particular night is, is, is unmatched um, by anything that I can remember in recent memory. Um, if Officer Gold can start st uh, walking up here. Um, he was patrolling uh, the area of Hollins Ferry and um, uh, Washington Boulevard um, in December of 2013, um, doing business checks as he was required to do. Unfortunately, around the holiday season, we, we always see an increase in um, commercial robberies at local businesses. He was checking the business and sure enough, as soon as he pulled into the parking lot, a uh, employee ran out and said, officer, officer, we're getting robbed. Um, he parked the van, he called for backup units. Um, he uh, strategically approached the building, um, not too fast because he wanted to be safe, but at the same time, he didn't want the suspect to get away. Suspect camp comes out. Uh, points a loaded handgun at the officer, tries to shoot the officer. He does not shoot the officer, thank goodness. The officer chases him on foot several blocks, catches the bad guy, gets the gun that he threw in a, in a garbage can, and made the arrest. Absolutely phenomenal case. Um, and the officer should be awarded for it.
We have, we have uh, um, one more uh, gift for the officer. Officer Gold, if you could come back up here real quick. Um, <laughs> Jack Baker has another gift from uh, the community association, donated by local businesses, um, and uh, he wanted to award that to him also. All of the citizens are really proud of you and what you do for us. We can go to bed and sleep because of people like you, and we appreciate that. One of our businesses is very active with us and partner, and that is Brian McComas from Raleigh's Oyster on Cross Street. And he is giving us to give to you a $50 gift certificate. They have wonderful food. You will enjoy it. Thank you so much. I'm free if you want to go have a waste. <laughs> Around, eight, what is it, 8.30? 8.30. We gladly gave up our meeting tonight to the mayor and the commissioner because it's all about public safety. Please ask questions that pertain to public safety. We don't want to talk about garbage cans tonight or potholes. This is about safety. If you have a comment for Madam Mayor or the Commissioner, send them an email. Tonight is crime. And if you start on something not crime, hear, you're going to hear this whistle. <laughs> Questions should be less than a minute. Again, if you really have a problem and it's going to take you a long time, email. Thank you all very much for being here. And Gus, thank you. Well, it is my, thank you, Jack, appreciate it. You ought to, let's put our hands together again. He's a hard worker for the community. It's my uh, honor and privilege to present uh, our mayor as she brings brief remarks on this, our third installment of a series of meetings throughout the city where the mayor meets with constituents, residents like you to discuss issues centered around public safety. I present Madam Mayor, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake. Thank you very much. Mark. All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you all uh, for coming out. I know that this is your regular CRC meeting, so I'm I am not under any uh, false uh, I'm not under any illusion that all of this is because of our public forum. You have a very strong CRC, Jack, and I'm uh, I am uh, I don't feel guilty at all taking advantage of it. So thank you very much for allowing us to uh, co-opt your uh, Southern District uh, CRC meeting. I love the Southern District CRC because you always have good food and you always yeah I know. And I also appreciate the fact that you uh, recognize an officer a month and the relationship that the Southern District CRC has with the Southern District Police uh, Station is, you know, it, it, it makes other districts jealous uh, because it's such a wonderful working relationship. So I want to thank you for your leadership in this community and for having a big tent. You know, you're always looking to find ways to increase the membership and increase the outreach that you do. Uh, with the CRC, and uh, I've even had Jack walk and help us with other communities outside of Southern District because he's such a great uh, and great leader, and uh, has it really sh an example, a shining example of how to engage the community. So thank you for being there for Southern District and for the entire city. I want to thank Mark, President uh, Mark uh, Mao for uh, hosting us this evening. It's a beautiful building, and um, I appreciate uh, the Federation allowing us to use this building as a community meeting space. It's a, it is certainly a beautiful venue, and I appreciate them doing that. I want to thank Commissioner Batts for being here and for being a partner. We have, um, you know, we're not done. We've made a lot of progress, uh, but the the one of the things that I know is we both share a commitment for progress in partnership with the community. That's the only way I think that we're going to get the dramatic results that we want and the results that will stick is if we do it in collaboration with the community. I want to thank Chief Ford. Please stand up, Chief Ford. This is our, our fire chief. I think we should give him a nice Charm City welcome. He's, yeah. 
He was sworn in just a few short weeks ago, and his team has been uh, phenomenal. And I want to thank you. You can have a seat now. And, and all of the, uh, the, the members of your department that came out with us that knocked on doors. We had a chance in many of the communities where we canvassed in preparation for this meeting to uh, put up uh, smoke detectors, to, to do uh, carbon monoxide checks, to put up the smoke detectors, and to, to share resources uh, with community members. And uh, so if you don't have a, a smoke detector, please know that uh, they, the fire department is there for you. If you call 311, they can get there within two hours. Uh, it's a little longer than a pizza, but if you order a pizza, by the time you finish the pizza, they'll be there. And they will do a, a, smoke to, a, a fire safety check, and they'll put up any, uh, what, however many free detectors that you need, smoke detectors that you need, they'll put them in, and they'll do it for free. And those batteries will last for 10 years, so you don't have to be annoyed twice a year listening to those batteries chirp. So and it's, it is a great resource. I'm supposed to be short, and I'm, I'm going to really try my best. I also want to thank Senator Bill Ferguson, who is here with us today. Thank you very much. And I, I want to thank the Vice President of the City Council, um, Councilman Ed Reisinger. He uh, came out with me, and uh, he's been a, a great partner for so many years. Uh, his his heart is in South Baltimore. Uh, if, if Please let there be no question of his commitment to the community. Um, you know, I like to stay on his good side. Uh, it doesn't always happen, but when it doesn't happen, it's because he doesn't think I'm doing right by his constituents, and and he wants to make sure that I do. When we end up, we end up there. Uh, and he's been such a tremendous help for me, a voice of uh, a voice of calm, a voice of reason, and a, and a voice of leadership on the council, and I'm very grateful for all of those things. So I'm gonna, I really wanna be um, brief. You know, again, we have a strategy that's, that has uh, shown results, and that's our focus on violent repeat offenders. Everyone in here knows that there's a small group, a small number of individuals that are causing a lot of the problems in Baltimore, and we have a laser-like focus on those uh, violent repeat offenders. I think it's important that I keep stressing that because even as the amount of arrests have gone down in Baltimore City, the, the violence has gone down because we're focusing on the problems, the, 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 you know, the problem children in our city, the ones who are causing the problems. We're not going back to a time of, of mass arrests and a time when many communities felt under siege. I know, uh, I know that I cannot uh, depend on communities to work in collaboration and in partnership, in real partnership with the police if they feel like they are under siege or unwelcome in their own communities. And I, and I have to say that the amount of community outreach that we've been doing, I know is working. And how do I know it's working? Is because over the last year, we've seen over 300% increase in the amount of information that's coming from the, from the community to the police that are, that's helping us uh, to bring, uh, to get violence under control in Baltimore. I also, uh, while we've done a lot of things to, to increase that enforcement, we also, are you cutting me off, Gus? All right, just checking. We also, I'm also uh, pleased that uh, one of the things I talked about um, in my state of the city is Operation Ceasefire that, is, uh, that will be coming. It's, they're here, but we haven't launched the program. We're, in the, we're done doing the data collection right now, uh, but we will be launching them soon. And, and Ceasefire is a community-based approach on those same targeted individuals the violent repeat offenders, and it, it is a way to do a couple of things, to tell those uh, violent repeat offenders that if they're willing, and, and if, they're, if they desire more for their lives, if they want to get out of the revolving door of the, the criminal justice system, we're willing to work with them, but if they're not, that uh, we are going to pull together all of the, the public uh, safety and justice resources that we have and bring them all down on them and their you know, the friends that they travel with. And um, so I'm looking forward to introducing that later this year, and I think it will add to the momentum that we've seen in the reduction of violent crime. So I know there's other things that I'm going to talk about, but I've already taken up too much of the time, and I want to leave some time for questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our police commissioner, Commissioner Betts. Thank you. I'm going to do like Jack uh, did. Hello, South Baltimore. Hello. Oh, come on. I hear this is a place to party, right? Right. <laughs> right. 
Uh, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for your, your valuable time uh, coming out tonight and allowing uh, my boss and I to, to uh, come before you. Uh, I'd like to uh, say thank you very much to Jack. Uh, when I arrived on the scene 18 months ago, Jack was one of the first people that I met with. Uh, we consist consistently and continue to have a good partnership together. Uh, we were on a walk on Saturday out in the community, uh, and it was very, very exciting to meet the, the residents uh, uh, within our community. Uh, there were several people who, who felt that they were a little unnerved that uh, for us coming up talking to the police, especially the police commissioner. One lady went up to Jack and said, you know, I'd like to meet the police commissioner, but I don't think I can talk to him. Uh, well, that's completely wrong, and that's, that's the, the statement that I'm trying to give across is that uh, we are, uh, starting with me, are approachable. We are those people who you pay the salary of through your tax dollars, so we're here to serve. And so as we come out here to the community, the message that I'm pushing very clearly is that we're building a customer-driven police department. This document here is my Bible. Well, let, let me stop and I'll, I'll go back one second because Jack said something that I have to clarify. When, uh, when uh, Jack called uh, Ian Dombrowski up, he called him Major. And I asked Jack, were you calling him out of his rank? Because uh, he's a captain. But, uh, you know, Jack tends to be clairvoyant. And uh, what happened is uh, uh, Captain uh, Ian Dombrowski came out number one on the testing for the position for Major. So give a round of applause right. to Major yeah. Ian Dombrowski of the Southern yeah. District. Stand up, Major. And I believe as of 5 o'clock yesterday, the mayor signed your paperwork. Right. So you should be thanking the mayor. <laughs> we are. Thank you. <laughs> so I wanted to, uh, I know uh, you're very excited about Ian. He's done a wonderful job down here. Uh, he's one of my superstars. Uh, we placed him in this position as I moved uh, Dave Reitz uh, downtown to do detectives. And so I've been extremely happy with the job that he's done down here quietly, just got on top of everything. And uh, the community have just said nothing but positive. So Ian, a job well done. You earned it. So thank you so very much. All right. This is our strategic plan. This is my Bible. This is uh, when I have staff meetings on Mondays. This is what we talk about, this document here. When recruits go to the police academy, uh, before they can graduate from the academy, they get tested on this document. When a sergeant takes a test, before they can get promoted on that, on that test, they get tested on this document. When a lieutenant takes a test, they get, uh, they get tested on what? This document. When Ian, Ian Dombrowski, <laughs> excuse me, excuse me. When Ian Dombrowski went to <coughs> allergies, I've never had allergies 53 years of my life until well, I came to the East Coast. Well, I apologize. <laughs> Ian Dombrowski, uh, when he took that test, took a test. Ian, what did you take a test on? <laughs> this is this is the Bible of the Baltimore Police Department. Uh, in here, it talks about some of the challenges that we have. Uh, it talks about how we're going to solve the challenges. Uh, I don't get paid to bring uh, issues to my bosses to say, this is an issue we can't solve them. I get paid to solve them. So we as a team are starting to solve these issues and move this police organization in the right and proper direction without going into a great amount of detail on this document, and it's on our website. So you can go on our website at any, any given point in time, and you can pull this document out. Uh, you will get 98% of everything that I have. The only 2% that you don't have is our deployment numbers. So we're very clear up here. There are some challenges here. Um, here the community says that we're off target from where they want us to be. Our job is to get on target from, from the, what the community wants from this police department. Uh, internally, the, the employees talk about the lack of resources that they need. Our job is to solve those problems and get them solved right away, and we're moving in the right direction. This, is, this book is really based off of three C's. The number one C is crime. The number one is violent crime within our city. That's our focus. But also for me, the probability or possibility of a woman being pulled down an alley and raped is important to me. The probability or the possibility of somebody breaking into your house, that's important to me. The probability or possibility of somebody breaking into your car and taking the things that you've earned in your vehicle, that's important to me. So this document doesn't just focus on one crime, it focuses on all the crimes and dropping all the crimes within the city as a whole. Also, the, the next C is, the first C is crime, second C is community. Number one thing is that we work for the people of this city who pay our tax dollars. We don't come to meetings or we do not direct the community. We listen to the community and turn their wants into the imperatives of this police department. So we will build a service-driven police organization. 
Number three is credibility. It's critical that we are a credible organization. I have no tolerance for scandals. I have no tolerance for bad policing. So the three C's in this, in, for, our, for this police organization going forward, crime, community, and credibility. And that's everything that we're, get, we're getting done here, and that's just how we're going to drive the city as a whole. Um, you know, usually what I do is I go around and introduce all of my command staff and all the police officers that uh, do the job here. I never, I never, I try to never go past a police officer without shaking his or her hand and thanking them for the job that they do on a, on a daily basis. I usually do not start a meeting without introducing the command staff because these are the people who get the job done. These are the people who are out there every single day risking their life to make sure that this city is safe. These are the people who have dropped the crime rate in this city in every single category that measures crime for this year. These are the people on these walls that are standing there, the people standing in the back, the people who are sitting up here in this front row who serve you and do a very good job. So you would help me if you would just give them a round of applause for the job that they do. Thank you very much, Commissioner, Madam Mayor. And uh, for the record, Madam Mayor, I would never cut you off. <laughs> While you were talking, I was inquiring about the menu to my left and their right. <laughs> Since I haven't eaten for that. No, I'm, I'm only teasing. Um, I would like to, as we begin, uh, we introduced Jack Baker. There are four other folks that are sitting in the front row with us this, this afternoon uh, who are joining with us, and they will actually begin uh, the questioning, the Q&A process. We will have one of the community leaders on the front ask a question, give an opportunity for a response, and then we will go to the floor for two questions. There are gentlemen on the floor, Mr. Lindsey Jackson, who's actually the community liaison for the Southern District. Uh, we have in the center aisle, Mr. Larry Nunley, who serves as the Southwest community liaison. And we have to my far right, your left, Mr. Christian Song, who serves as the Central District uh, Community Liaison. We have with us this evening Mr. Eric Costello. If you would just wave your hand or stand, feel free to stand. And everyone, welcome your community leader from Federal Hill. Uh, we have Ms. Keisha Allen from Westport, who's joining with us this evening. Uh, we have Ms. Ann Robinson from Mount Winings. Good to see you, Ms. Robinson. Always a pleasure. And we have also Mr. Andy Dyes of Curtis Bay. I saw Andy coming in uh, as I got on the elevator. Good to see you again, sir. We are going to have Jack Baker start off, if he doesn't mind uh, breaking the ice. And if we're going to ask, we're going to ask, Jack, that when you stand, present your question. And after asking a question, everyone else, we're asking that you uh, then return to your seat, and I'll tell you why. Not because we don't want to see your, <laughs> hear your voice or see your face. There are cameras in the room, and we don't want to block other uh, folks who will be viewing via television, nor do we want to block our, our residents who are in the audience. Thank you. Jack? This question's for the commissioner. The most popular question, or the one that I am asked most often, is where are the cops? I never see them. I know the answer, but I think you should do it. I think, I think that question is probably uh, multifolded. Um, did I just invent a word? I think I did. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I think it has multiple levels. Um, one of the things that I usually get in the community is that we want to see the officers on walking beats. Uh, we want to get them out of the cars. We want them in the neighborhoods, and, and we want to uh, have that connectivity. Last year, we started a program of when officers come out of the academy, their first assignments are walking beats. Uh, and we put them in some of the tougher neighborhoods within our community to have the officers walk out of there. And part of what I'm trying to get across is I want them to touch the community, I want them to be engaged in the community, and I want to, to get them to the point where they have muscle memory when they drive those cars, they stop the cars, get out of the cars, and, and touch the community as a whole. 
Uh, and so we're gonna we're gonna push and continue to push along those lines. I think the last time I was here for a meeting in, in the southern, probably about a month ago, I think it was Ian. One of the questions actually it was over at the station. One of the questions was asked was the same thing. We're gonna continue to push, especially as we get our numbers up, to uh, get more officers uh, out of the cars, out on walking beats. I know it's clear to me that's what the community wants. Uh, if we can't put them on walking beats, I want to put them on bicycles. So you get to see them, you get to touch them, and you know that they're there on a regular basis. We may have or try to build little cadres that move around the city as a whole. But the mayor has authorized uh, me earlier this, this uh, year. She and I have talked uh, as I was telling her about the strategies of what we were doing. And so we're, we're going to put officers, especially into our zones, in quadrants on foot to uh, be seen more and uh, be more available and uh, be highly visible to you, Jack, so you can see them all the time. If you don't see them, then I'll take that major rank away from Ian, and, and he'll be back to the captain, but you should see him. Okay. We have a question from the floor. Please raise your hand, and I'll have someone. Yes, sir, in the blue checkered shirt. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I'm in the Southwest, in the Union Square neighborhood and participate in the Southwest Partnership. With the recent shooting in that area, and we're concerned, and you just took part in going to national uh, collective of captains, do you find that this issue with heroin, this issue with crime, specifically in this city, as you spoke last month, about it's a chronic issue in this community, in this city, that are there are any new tools that you have been made aware of that you're able to actually tap into and actually address this and put people away and make them go away and actually rid this city of the chronic prime and this constant issues that we have plaguing us and educate the folks. Okay, there was a couple, there's a couple different uh, questions that you have in there. But uh, yesterday I had the opportunity and I think what you were referring to, I was down in Washington, D.C. and I was at, with, uh, at a symposium of about 250 police uh, chiefs and commissioners and practitioners and medical practitioners and healthcare specialists. And uh, what we're seeing nationwide, and it's occurring here within our city also, is uh, overdoses of heroin, overdoses from heroin. Uh, there's a, also an additive called fentanyl that has been added to heroin itself, uh, which are causing some deaths uh, throughout the state of Maryland and throughout the nation as a whole. Uh, the amount of heroin nationwide has gone up we have Mexican cartels that are sending more, more heroin within the uh, United States. The reason for that is that uh, in the early 2000s, there was a, a national problem of, uh, especially with young people, taking opiate uh, prescription drugs. And so we had, we had a, uh, uh, an epidemic nationwide of young people doing prescription drugs. Well, we, we in law enforcement saw that trend happening, and over the years, we really cranked down on uh, doctors giving prescriptions and the availability for prescription drugs. What we're seeing is that there's a trend or a movement away from the opiate-based pres prescription drugs to heroin. And the young people are not shooting heroin. What they're doing is snorting heroin now. And that's the trendy thing to do. What they're starting to see nationwide, which is un unusual for, is that the trend is moving away from heroin in urban environments, and they're moving heroin is moving into the suburban environments now. And so it's really sending a shock wave through the community. When we were yesterday, when we were having a conversation with the health uh, professionals, all of our data and stats are about four years old. We could not ask police departments to understand why you have data data on overdose that's about four years old. And that was nationwide that was occurring. And so it was a hue and cry from us to get more, better data to better understand this uh, phenomenon that's taking place. And we had a number of parents in that room who were police chiefs who shared about their own kids who got caught up in these, um, who got caught up taking painkillers and they moved from painkillers to heroin because they couldn't take painkillers killers again, or again, excuse me, as I lose my voice. But what they were sharing is that this is becoming a national problem. I think uh, uh, your, your question is another fold, which, it, which is, can we solve the problem? I have Gatorade, <laughs> Mayor, thank you. They're asking, can you solve this problem by making an arrest of people who have addictions? I don't think that's the formal solution. Uh, what, we can, what we're going to do and what we're continuing to do is focus on the violence that accompanies the drugs uh, and drug sales uh, because there's a market here and we're trying to get rid of or eradicate the markets that we have. But we also as a nation have to deal with the addiction rates that are occurring. Now I'm really going to get myself in trouble because I'm going to get out of my lane. 
The other second issue that we started discussing is the legalization of marijuana nationwide. And so we had about five chiefs of police from Colorado, and they were talking about uh, uh, marijuana and the legalization of marijuana. So that was our, our entire day as, as we shared and we talked about as a whole. Uh, I think how we, we are going to eradicate the problem as a whole is that you can't deal with the addiction as a criminal justice problem. It has to be dealt as a health problem, and you have to get treatment. Uh, one of the programs that I see that works very well, and uh, the governor's wife uh, oversees this as the judge, Miss um, um, O'Malley has drug court, where you make an you make an arrest of someone who's dealing in narcotics or under influence of narcotics, and you send them to drug court. And dr drug court, I think, has a 90% success rate that you don't have recidivism. Those are the proactive programs that we have to develop and continue to solve the problem long range. Thank you, Commissioner. We will now go to Ms. Ann Robinson of Mount Winans and ask that she presents her question. Uh, if she looks, <laughs> did I put you on the spot, Ms. Robinson? Well, no, because okay. Lindsay sent me an email and asked me if I had a question. Mm -hmm. And so now that I'm here and I heard what you said in the beginning that, or someone said in the beginning that this, oh, Jack said he didn't want to hear about trash cans and potholes and things like that. And basically, that's what my question was about, because it is a safety issue. Please present your question. Then. Okay. <laughs> Holland, Holland's Ferry Road, mm -hmm. from Washington Boulevard <clears throat> to Patapsco Avenue, is just a disaster. You cannot drive down that street on one side or the other you have to drive down the middle of the street in certain areas because otherwise on each, uh, in the gutter more or less or more out from the gutter is nothing but potholes. And I don't mean, I mean something that's gonna ruin your vehicle. And so my thing is, Holland's Ferry Road will not sustain another winter whether it be like the winter we just had or just the plain another winter, because otherwise it's gonna end up with a sinkhole. And so therefore the residents of, I live in Mount Wannans, will not be able to get to 95 or Washington Boulevard or Potasco Avenue, which are avenues out of our community. So I just wanna know if there is something that's gonna be done about Hollins Ferry Road this year and before winter since in next year. So, Ms. Robinson, uh, thank you for the, for the question. Uh, with respect to any resurfacing for, for, for that road, I just, as we were doing public safety, I didn't, I didn't ask that ahead of time to find out um, that, that information so I can get that to you or have Lindsay get that to you. With respect to the potholes, I, I hope we all understand how uh, unique the winter that we just had was. Uh, it was a relentless uh, winter uh, that didn't give us a chance to catch up. Um, we had more water main breaks, uh, you know, his, historic number of water main breaks throughout the city, as well as, ex ex and expectedly, uh, a record number of potholes. So while transportation is doing hundreds, if not a thousand, you know, at least a thousand a day, uh, we have a backlog because of the, um, the intensity of uh, the, the cold weather in this winter. So I can tell you that, um, you know, help us out if you think we don't have it in the system to call it in to 311. Uh, we, we do um, proactive as well as, you know, reactive um, pothole filling, but it's not, the, the turnaround time isn't the normal turnaround time just because of the sheer volume uh, that we have. It doesn't matter until the winter's over. And you saw it just was snowing like two nights ago. Right. The, the problem isn't that we're not patching it. The, as long as it keeps the, the, yeah. the temperatures continue to dip and we have to treat, it's gonna, the, it, if it's a pothole, it's not done until the season is done. Right. You know, so we're not, it, this was a, a horrible, horrible uh, winter in so many ways. And, and I wish it would just be over. So. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. And I just would like to. And Gus, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I did want. I, I did 
forget to acknowledge uh, two people. Delegate Luke uh, Clippinger came in at some point while we were talking. I know I just saw him a second ago. Oh, he just stepped out, sorry. Well, he was here. I want you right. to know that your delegate was here. And I also uh, wanted to acknowledge uh, my DPW director, Rudy Chow, who is here as well. Uh, and he's doing a, a, an excellent job. Uh, and it was one of the things, we can clap for him. He's, uh, he's, he has worked very hard, uh, particularly with the, the waterfront partnership and in the implementation of the citywide street sweeping that will help keep our waterways uh, clean. Uh, he is the one who is uh, introducing that to the city and I'm very proud about that, so thank you, Rudy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And in that uh, vein, I just want to, Demetrius, yes, Demetrius Melisham serves as liaison in our west and northern districts. Uh, we do have some folks who would like to pose a question that may be uh, subsidiary, if you will, of direct issues that, you know, focusing on crime, like grime, issues of grime. We have Rudy Chow who is here, but Demetrius will go around and he will take your information down uh, and, and make sure that we follow up. I just wanted to make that um, announcement. Is there another question from the floor? Now, uh, Sir, the lady here on the end had her hand up first. No, Larry, just a sec, but I'll, because you're there, Larry, we're gonna ask for the gentleman in the blazer and then the lady here on the end here. Sir, if you would ask your question and then we'll go straight to uh, our resident here on the end. Um, well, I live in the Hollins Market community right before Union Square, and um, it's a small little community and nestled in that community right on the corner of Arlington and Pratt Avenue is uh, the state's largest methadone clinic, which moved into the community a couple years ago. And since it's moved in, there's been a high influx of crime to the area. And the drug activity is very blatant and direct um, with no discretion to where you can literally stand out there and take pictures and they don't care. And uh, the drug facility actually boasts a 5% success rate and I'm wondering if there is any plans or any awareness as to this, uh, the correlation between the drug activity with the clinic and if there's any plans to, for some, anything to be done about this. So yes, there are. And uh, most of these facilities are state regulated and we've, we've been fighting this issue in uh, the Southwest as well as in and around the Lexington market area. It's been a big, big problem. Uh, that's really been the concentration. Is that there's, I think, one or two communities in Northwest that have uh, had to deal with this, but mostly um, the, the, where the programs and the communities uh, are bumping up against each other is in uh, Southwest for the residential community and in Western for the uh, business community. So we have, we've had, we started having meetings uh, about um, you know, the, the expectations of the community. So getting the feedback from the community, uh, from, you know, acknowledging the, what the problems are as well as bringing in the state partners to figure out what we can do uh, and what the state can do in their regulation capacity to, inf uh, to enforce reasonable standards uh, with the community. So um, if, just keep your, if, just make sure that you connect and give your information to Demetrius before, and we can try to we can try to connect you with with what we're what we're doing there. Um, certainly not done, but it is something that we're we're working on. If I could uh, also cover that uh, yes, sir. Uh, answer very quickly, <clears throat> I'm very familiar with the spot in the area that uh, you have a, you have addressed and that uh, you're talking about. I've actually been out there within the last uh, three weeks uh, to observe and, and check the area myself because we got complaints coming in um, uh, prior to this. Uh, what I can say is that uh, it is clearly uh, on my radar. I think you will see some action in the, in the, in the future, uh, but we are very much aware of that. So um, hopefully in the future you will be very pleased with uh, what's the result. And I, I guess what I want to stress is it's a twofold issue. It's an immediate, the immediate public safety issue that the, the commissioner is talking about, but also the long term. How do, how do these, um, how do these facilities that can go into communities by right, how can they coexist uh, without uh, the, the negative impact on the community? So that's what, that's what the, the thing that we're working on. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, ma'am. And after you, I'm going to come to Andy for questions from the front, and then the young lady in the pink will come to you. Okay, I'm, I'm relating to crime, and I, I'm sorry, I'm Maxa Davis, Mount Winans uh, Community Association. There's two problems. We're grateful that all those ho ho um, city houses are being torn down, the school for 32 years we've been begging for. We're grateful for that. But now we got big, big rats and big, funny-looking animals coming around. That's number one. But the, the, the issue that, of crime, right there on the corner of, of uh, Packer and Hollins Ferry Road at the um, basketball court, where someone was killed there a couple of years ago, we got not the children anymore. It, when the summer comes in, Jack and those know, people come from all over, and it's beginning to start again. So I, hopefully that somebody will keep an eye on that corner there, that basketball court. What's the location again, ma'am? Uh, um, um, Packer and Hollis Fair Road across from Sherman Williams Paint Company. Okay. Uh, Major, could you cover that also? Could you share what uh, your background on, on that, Ian? question was uh, related to Packa and Hollins Ferry by the basketball court. Co congregation there, yeah. Um, that has been brought to our attention in the last couple weeks, especially with the weather getting a little bit warmer. Um, what we're going to do in the next uh, couple months as we move into the summer is focus on um, a deployment strategy in the area to at least provide police presence, to try to deter um, the congregations from getting out of control. Um, we, we also know that there's there's issues, especially last year, with the thefts in the neighborhood of, of for example, the air conditioning units and whatnot. Um, so we're just going to shift that that deployment that we, we already had planned um, and tweak it a little bit towards um, the large number of groups of people coming in from other neighborhoods to your neighborhood, because oftentimes that that causes conflict and can lead to more serious crime. Um, so we're going to continue to work on that, and I'll make sure um, that I follow up with you because um, I know you're at the meetings every month, and I'll have you'll see some results by next month. Great. Thank you. I pointed to Eric, but I was referring to you, Andy. So oh, I, I did right. say Andy. So I get confused. Andy of Come Curtis on. Bay. <laughs> um, first, I'd like to uh, recognize Officer Dina Roney, who actually is our community liaison officer. Um, she tirelessly comes to our community meetings every month, fills us in on the latest stats, makes us all feel good that we're living in a safe community. Um, Curtis Bay is probably the most remote community in the city, being as far as... Oh, uh, we're, well, we're a little further south. <laughs> and Brooklyn. Um, one question I have is uh, the city has used cameras to help deter and also to witness areas that are high in crime. Uh, we were told years ago with the technology that was in existence that uh, Curtis Bay and Brooklyn were too far away to have crime cameras or you know a visible way of putting eyes on the street. Um, has that technology changed and are there plans to put more cameras on the streets to help offset you know, where officers can't be on a continuous basis. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I, I can't tell you if uh, the fiber optics have come in to, to enable that. That's something that I'll follow up on and get you an answer to that. Um, we are changing our cameras now. We're, we're moving from the old-fashioned cameras to HD cameras that we have sharper pictures because what we've found is that uh, we're getting pictures of activities taking place, but they're not sharp enough to identify the faces. One of the things I have the guys also looking at and uh, trying to get a price in the technology is I want facial rec recognition. So what the technology has increased at this point in time where you can use facial recognition to identify who suspects are. So to go through our database and our systems on prior arrests where we're taking photos and, uh, and identify. So we have, uh, we're reaching out to vendors now to bring vendors in to take a look at that uh, to see if we can uh, move that direction. I spent, a, I spent a lot of time in Curtis Bay in Brooklyn uh, I'm down there a lot. A lot. Um, I go down uh, a, a lot on Friday nights and Saturday nights, so we spend a lot of times. Those guys, those guys over there have uh, shown me many parts of it, so I go from Cherry Hill down to Brooklyn to Curtis Bay. Uh, we've also done something that we, one of the things that I was kind of concerned about is that uh, being so far uh, south, 
that uh, uh, my guys, if they needed uh, backup, where would the backup come from? Because we're, we're coming from a ways, and, and geographically, the city is just configured that way. So I, I ended up in a good uh, relationship with Anne Arundel County uh, and their police officers there. So we basically have erased the line. Our officers go over to Anne Arundel. Anne Arundel comes over, comes over to us. Uh, part of uh, what we're doing, we're taking that uh, concept as, as a whole. And uh, we just had a meeting about two weeks ago of all the, all the police operations in the region. So we had uh, Baltimore County, we have Anne Arundel County, we had PG there. We had all the police departments around us. And what we're trying to do is have conversations where we share information, erase the border lines because the crooks don't know where the border lines are, nor do they care. So they go back and forth to Anne Arundel, to Baltimore County, into our city and back and forth. So we're doing a better job of communicating, working as teams and working as organizations to make sure that we have better coverage as a whole as force multipliers. And I have to say, and I apologize to the mayor, as a California boy growing up on the West Coast, I kind of like the snow. Sorry about that. Why, thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Karen Fretz from Union Square. And uh, I'm going to give you four questions. Let me put my glasses back on. <laughs> I used to be the, I, two years I was vice president of Union Square and two years subsequent to that I served as um, president of Union Square and the rehab, the drug rehab places were big time on my radar screen. And I have a little bit of a problem with those places and with all due respect, I'm not challenging you, but I would just like to say that you mentioned state regulations. Um, I don't know about now because I'm not as active as I used to be, but back then it was a joke. I took Dr. Bielenson through several of those places, and I mean, the very first day on Lombard Street, the, you know, we have a lot of these knuckleheads who uh, start these programs. There's a lot of money, money to be made. We, the very first day we walked into several of these places, and they had like 20, 25, 30 guys living in these places, and they were getting a couple thousand dollars a month for each one of these guys, and they were packed in there. They were filthy, dirty places. They had bad plumbing. And, you know, I have a problem with them in that, you know, they want to come to my neighborhood and set up because it looks like a relatively nice, quiet place where they can sneak in and set up their dirty little camps. But, you know, really, state regulators, do they ever visit those places? So um, the next one is... Uh, I call 911 a lot. Um, lately, they've been asking at least two times, what is the phone number from which you are calling? Well, <laughs> a few months ago, I was witnessing a crime like that involved a gun <laughs> that was shooting near me. And when I called 911, I really didn't feel like telling them my phone number twice. I was like, could you just get a cop here? So I, I kind of appreciate that they need to know but I'm not sure, you know, sometimes, uh, I'm not sure communications is, is working all that effectively. They, they're a lot better than they have been in years. And my next question, so that's a statement. Uh, please come back. Okay. Another question is, uh, don't crime and grime go hand in hand? Okay. But we're not allowed to talk to that. I don't want to shake up Jack. So my last one is a statement, and it's um, twofold. First of all, um, the three of us, and I'm sure everybody else here, we personally want to congratulate Ian Dombrowski. We, we love our major. And having said that we love our major, as Mr. Baker says every month, Southern has the best damn cops in the city. Karen, uh, I'm going reverse order. I'm, I'm, I am uh, glad since, you know, my hand was like this. I was like, am I going to sign it? Am I not going to? I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm, I'm, but I'm glad you're, sat you're, you're satisfied, uh, well, very, more than satisfied with the, uh, the new promotion for uh, Major uh, Dombrowski. As far as crime and grime, I agree. And that was one of the impetus of us uh, expanding the citywide uh, street sweeping because we saw that it made a difference in some of the business communities and we looked for ways that we could expand it and use the, the assets that we had uh, more effectively and efficiently to help uh, reduce the, the grime in our communities. Um, because 
I think, you know, as you said, when people are looking for for places to set up business, whether it's the the um, the nuisance uh, businesses that you talked about or the, the uh, treatment facilities or nuisance houses, they look for for signs of neglect. And try and grime is one of those. So that is that is one of the reasons why we work to that we we focused on ways to expand the the citywide street sweeping so we could do that. in my CRP, Citizens on Patrol. I walk in several of these neighborhoods, and we all have the same problem. Look, 1,700 people live in Union Square, and you know you get five people who show up for, for meetings. That means 1,695 are sitting on their butts. But I go to all these different neighborhoods, and it's the same people all the time, and we have the same problem. It's trash, and it's the same people. But why does Miss Ann have to spend her life going after these people? These people, they, we need harder laws regarding this stuff. It, you know, Miss Maxie last year, Miss Maxie, I, she was nearly in tears. They kept stealing her her generator, which is locked up in a cage. So I, you know, it, it, I don't it, think we're in disagreement, and the the. But our, 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 is the city actually going after people so one with trash? Not in my neighborhood, they're not. So yes, and one of the pieces of the legislation that we were able to get through the uh, in this session was to, to increase the penalties for illegal dumping. Um, we can make sure that if there are particular people that need to be cited for the way that they're throwing out their trash or not throwing it out or whatever they're doing, that we can be more intentional about citing, uh, working with you and citing those individuals. Um, it, but the problem didn't the the, it, the couple the problem didn't happen overnight. It's not going to change overnight, but the fact of the matter is, I don't. I didn't just notice the problem. We're doing something about it by doing the citywide street sweeping. We're we are using the resources that you pay for with your taxes in a different way to help keep your community cleaner. And I also, and and we can also work to cite those individuals. It's not either or. I think it's both, and we'll make sure that we follow up. It's not either or. I, I want more police on my streets. How many murders have we had in, in Raxton and Providence in the last couple of weeks? And I don't even care if they're murders. I mean, people doing, doing bad things. I want my tax dollars to go to make... Which is why, even though we had over $120 million in uh, budget deficits while other jurisdictions around the, 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 the country were cutting police and fire, I didn't lay off one single firefighter, didn't lay off one uh, police officer because... Okay, so a um, couple of things. Number one, we can make sure to follow up that, that Lindsay follows up with you and we coordinate this, the, the trash citations and um, understand that the reason, I mean, it is, it, it is important for us as we work on to, we have e the federal regulations for um, trash and things like that uh, in our waterways. So this is a, this is, Yes, it's a crime issue, a grime issue, but it's also a way that we're trying to use our resources to uh, be compliant with, um, you know, our stormwater um, remediation of the the trash that goes into the, the to the drains and to the the, um, you know, our waterways with the citywide street sweeping. So I think it'll be helpful. Um, it would be in a perfect world, your neighbors would do what they're supposed to do with their trash. Uh, but until then, we are expanding the street sweeping, and we can work with you and your and your association on who needs to be cited for the um, their the way that they do the trash. And we look for ways during the legislative session to increase the penalties for individuals who are illegally dumping in the city. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I got a follow up question. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. She had a whole list of them, uh, real quick. Um, yeah. Um, one of the things, or, or listening to a couple of things, I want Ian, when you have a chance, I want to talk about the violent crime that's in the Southern. Um, your violent crime is down overall about 22%, and then you're down on homicides, you're down on shootings. Uh, Ian, if you will cover that in a second. But uh, I, I think more than just talking about numbers, we want to talk about safety and the feeling, the feeling of safety and the perception of safety overall. <clears throat> you shared, you talked about the 911 calls. One of the things that came out of the strategic plan that's pretty clear citywide, um, the city ranked out of uh, all the residents here, they ranked about eight things that they want 
the city to focus on. And so we can't focus on all of the long list of eight, but we're focusing on the top four. And two of the categories in top four kind of come, to, come together as a whole. One, number one was violent crime. Uh, next to violent crime, right on the edge was uh, service from the 911 dispatch system. That was number two. Uh, number three was gangs, which goes with number one, which is the violence. And number four was property crimes. And that, those are the four focus uh, areas that we're going, out, we're going after as an organization. And that's clear because in, an, in a strategic plan, the citizens talk about 911. 911 doesn't come under the police department. Uh, it's out of uh, uh, Moet, which is a subdivision of, uh, of uh, another agency. So one of the things when I saw this in a strategic plan, although they don't come under me, we're starting to have uh, monthly meetings, if not bi-weekly meetings, dealing with policies, and we're starting to audit what's going on in a 911 system. We have a, we have a young man that has just been moved over there uh, to address some of the issues that were taking place over there. Uh, he's very good at what he's doing. He's changing the training. He's changing the professionalism over there. But uh, what I'm going to start doing is getting my fingers very much involved uh, because it's such a significant issue within the organization. So what I'm sharing with you is that we're going to follow up and stay on top of those calls. Um, and you shouldn't be have to, and I want to know why they're asking your phone number, why it's not popping up on the system. Uh, so we're going to take a look at that. The other thing is, uh, Ian, I want you to go back to this gentleman from Curtis Bay and make sure that uh, we talked to Lieutenant Hood. His question was, what, do we have fiber optics down there and can we do more cameras? So we'll get back to you on that question. And Ian, if you could talk a little bit about your area with violent crime. And Chief Ford, I think you wanted to speak to the 911. Chief, if you can take the mic. Thank you. Chief. One of the reasons why they may ask that, those questions, the gentleman that he was spoken, speaking about that went into 911, uh, he knew he had to make a whole lot of corrections or uh, improve certain things in the organization. So what he did was he used a, a model of accreditation for a dispatch organization, which is a very high level model. So there's certain things they have to ask and they, they're actually being graded. He's actually grading every dispatcher for asking uh, location, make sure they, they're confirming that, asking twice, asking phone numbers, possibly asking twice. So that's why that's happening. Um, as far as the violent crime goes, obviously you know well about the uh, latest murder, um, which happened uh, right near Highlands Market, bordering Union Square, and it's a disturbing crime. Um, the detectives have a lot of very good leads and to include a witness that, that the, our operations guy guys brought in today. Um, so we're, we're very eager to close that case. But uh, uh, looking at the bigger picture in the Southern District, homicides year to date are down 17%. Um, rapes are down uh, 11%. Uh, robberies are down 23%. And aggravated assaults are down 22%. That includes shootings, non-fatal shootings down 29%. So um, it is certainly disconcerting that there still is violent crime, but looking at the bigger picture, we are moving in the right direction with, with the violence in, in the Southern District. Um, you, you, you had something? Correct. And, and I do know, I do have it here, um, the Western has made some significant progress this year also. However, that, that area, Franklin Square, Union Square, Highlands Market, um, is, uh, is a work in progress and, and the officers are focused on the area. In fact, starting Monday, we're doing an, initi an initiative in that area. We're moving in um, some of the uh, special operations officers. They're gonna be there for at least three weeks. Um, and we're also implementing a, a deployment strategy from the Southern District officers. So you will see an increased police presence in the next um, three weeks, um, moving into the warmer, warmer months. Um, you did also mention some of the frustrations that your neighbors had with stuff getting stolen. Um, for the first time in, um, since I've been here, we are um, very focused on property crime in these neighborhoods. I'm sorry, um, could you say that again? For the, for the first time in, in, since I've been here, we, we are focused, and I actually answer to him every morning about the cro property crime numbers and the property crime trends throughout um, my district. The other commanders have to do the same thing throughout their districts. Um, and I have a log here that I keep every morning of, of all the property crimes reported in, in a 24-hour period. In the past, um, to be honest, we, we, may have, we may look at those numbers once a week. We look at those uh, daily, um, if not hourly, 
at the present time and, 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 and develop strategies to end trends before they get out of control. Um, the uh, property crime um, year to date in the Southern District um, has decreased um, by 1%. That's not a large enough percent. I'd like to see that percent um, become larger of, of a decrease. Um, our stolen autos are up. They're stealing a lot of Dodge products, a lot of Honda products. Um, we're seeing that trend not only in the Southern, but the Southwest, the Western, and um, I believe the Northwest District, the whole West side of the city. Um, many of you in, in, in your neighborhood may have received a, a call within the past week. Um, we, we, we put out a robocall to 2,000 residents warning them of the fact that um, Dodge products and, and Honda products are at jeopardy of being stolen. Um, Ian, can I jump in there? What, yes, what, sir. As he brings it up, which is really strange for us, is 50% of our stolen cars are coming from people leaving keys in cars. 50% of the stolen cars, and this is really driving the overall crime rate for the city is stolen autos, people leaving keys in cars, and the numbers are so dramatically high, I'm wondering if there's any fraud or some fraudulent reason that's behind it. Uh, you know, we have conversations about it because when it comes up daily, I'm asking these guys, they identify a problem, they have to come up with a strategy. Is the strategy working? And we do this every 24 hour period to find out what's happening. Uh, but uh, those, that amount of cars keeps getting stolen. And first it was, it's cold. People need to warm up the cars. They don't want to put the kids in a cold car, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also, it's not as cold as it was and that's still happening. So we're, we're looking right now to see if there's something else behind this other than people just leaving uh, keys in their cars and the numbers are up dramatically. As uh, Ian is trying to get some more information, as you talked about the Western, and I don't wanna drop, drown you in numbers because numbers don't mean anything if you're seeing different things. The Western has a 82% reduction in homicides this year. Uh, last year was a, a, a number that was out of control. This year, they've only had uh, three homicides compared to 17 the same time last year. That's an 82% reduction. Their shootings are down 31%. So actually, the Western is decreasing dramatically. They're having a very good year. However, when you say I'm still seeing activities, that's my bigger concern, and that we'll pay attention to that and focus on that. Thank you, sir. We have three people that are up next. One is the young lady in the pink on the end, yes, and before you speak, we have the gentleman who's in the back behind you, Larry, uh, one of our guardian angels. And after you, ma'am, we will have the gentleman, uh, guardian angel, and then we will come to Eric on the front row, Eric Costello. Yes, ma'am. Better hurry up before I forget everything I want to say. I'm Pat Wills from Brooklyn, and I want you to know the president of our Concerned Citizens is here. She's new, and she's Diane Ingram. And Madam Mayor, your people were out Saturday filling potholes at Washington Boulevard and West Patepsico Avenue. So they're out there working hard. I was real impressed. Uh, you want to know where the cop cars are? They're down in Brooklyn and Curtis Bay. I don't know where the rest of you are having a problem. And maybe I shouldn't fill you in on my little secret. I got a call from my councilman's office. Councilman Reisinger, maybe about two months ago, and I don't know if the program was coordinated through the commissioner or through our new major, but we were asked for the trouble spots in Brooklyn. I'm in Brooklyn, and we gave the trouble spots, and those are really being patrolled and watched, and I've seen a lot more police cars down in Curtis Bay, so don't change, please. I'm very happy what's going on in Brooklyn and Curtis Bay. And I just don't know if this was a program that just came out of councilman and the major, or if this was something coordinated from the commissioner. Thank you. We appreciate it. Actually, I have to give the credit to my chief of staff who's doing a better job communi communicating with the council, and we have a better relationship. So as the councilman identifies those, he's given to us, and we're getting them to Ian, and we're getting on top of them as quickly as possible. So thank you so very much. It's good to hear that it's working. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, please. Good evening. I'm Taxman from the Baltimore Guardian Angels, and I have a question about the new casino that's opening up. I've been in the industry. Wait, excuse me for one second. You're a tax man asking about a casino. <laughs> Not me. You. Okay. It's his nickname. No, I happen to have a few postgraduate degrees, and that's why they call me Taxman. But my question simply is, is that um, with the new casino opening up and the way that it's being built and being in the industry for so many years, gaming industry, what are your strategies and what have you done over the past couple of years? Well, what has Baltimore City Police done to develop a partnership with senior management at Horseshoe? 
You know, I, I thank you so very much for throwing me that softball, so I sincerely appreciate it. Uh, the young lady who I put in charge of that strategy, and she's been working on this for the last year or so, uh, when, it, when, it, when the bill passed last year, within seven days, the management of the casino came and met with me, within seven days. Bill passed, they're in my office, we're sitting down having a conversation. And from that point, uh, I pointed to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Melissa Hyatt, who has been uh, at a number of meetings. Melissa, uh, you have the microphone. Could you share a little bit of uh, where we're going and what's happening? Yes, sir. We have weekly meetings now with the management of the casino. The assistant general manager has a very good relationship with not only the police department, but the fire department, office of emergency management, department of transportation, and other city agencies as well. We're working together very closely. The primary objective, as we know, concerns from a lot of people in the community surrounding the casino was, as was relayed to us, for the fact that they were concerned that once the casino opened, that their public safety services would be diminished because of the demands for the casino. We can assure you that based on meetings that we've had and deployment that's being planned to actually begin before the casino opens, that's not going to happen. We're making sure that the resources that are dedicated to that area, the footprint surrounding the casino, will ensure that those of you that live in neighborhoods around the casino will have, if anything, enhanced public safety resources. You won't be impacted by the nature of the demand of the calls that are coming around the casino or things that might be impacted by its activity. Does that answer your question? And I, I think what we also did, and I forget that, did we, did we send you to Cincinnati uh, to go see? They have a new casino there. We're sending a, a, um, a command down to New Orleans to see how they do their casino. Um, and Melissa, on her own, has done a lot of investigation of Anne Arundel County or Arundel Mills uh, Casino and how they're running it. So if you could share a little bit from this, that's him. Yes, sir. We've been trying to, part of our strategy has been benchmarking off of other cities who have already have established casinos or to learn the challenges that they experienced during their first years. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel with this. Other cities have been very gracious and helpful. They've been giving us suggestions that they wish that they had done at the beginning. And it's really helping us as we're planning our public safety plan, predominantly police and fire, to make sure that we can start this project and we'll be fully prepared for the opening. And as the commissioner indicated, we traveled to Cincinnati and the assistant general manager of Horseshoe was present with us. We had the opportunity to speak not just to casino security and management of the casino, but also local law enforcement. And we've also done this at Arundel Mills, Maryland Live. And we continue to reach out to other cities to get information from them. That way, when this casino does open, we're completely prepared for it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. We have Eric, and then after Eric, Ms. Eddie Bland Thomas. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, Commissioner, thanks for coming out to the community. Um, my question, well, my comment and question has to do with the impact of our patrons when they leave the Cross Street area. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this issue. Um, Ever since you gave the directive, Commissioner, back in uh, early August, uh, Major Dombrowski and the Southern District have been fantastic. I think we've had something like 260 or 270 uh, citations and arrests on uh, late nights on the weekends. Uh, we've seen what I believe to be, and from what I've been hearing, a marked improvement in uh, the decrease in quality of life issues related to the bar patrons. Uh, there's been a uh, and, and Councilman Cole was instrumental in, in helping push that along uh, as well. Uh, I know that there's been some concerns related to whether or not capacity and maximum capacity in establishments is being enforced. I know Councilman Cole got a uh, policy from uh, Fire Chief Ford, uh, and the 10-second gist of that policy is that if a fire marshal is not on duty, the closest fire vehicle will go immediately to the establishment partner with uh, the folks from the police department, uh, close the establishment down, uh, count capacity, and if there's a capacity violation, issue a citation, and so on and so forth, and that goes to the liquor board, et cetera. Uh, what I was hoping is that uh, you, Commissioner, and Fire Chief Ford, and of course, Madam Mayor, feel free to chime in, if you could provide clarification about your understanding of how uh, not only the enforcement of the quality of life uh, crimes that are occurring as a result of the bar patrons, and how that's improved, 
as well as clarification on how that policy uh, regarding capacity enforcement is actually implemented in the neighborhood. Very good. Um, I'm going to start off and to give you the high level of what my direction is, and I'm going to have Ian, uh, who thought he was going to sit down and relax, share how that uh, policy has been implemented. Um, I spent a tremendous amount of time out on the streets, and like I was saying, I was in Curtis Bay, I was down in Brooklyn. I go through all these areas. I want to see, I want to touch, I want to feel, I want to know. Uh, when we have complaints come in from any area or when we have violence that takes place in the city, I get out there. I want to see, I want to talk to the residents, I want to know what's going on. So usually when I'm out on a Friday or Saturday night, I usually go to the, the spots that have had violence in the city for that past week. I want to see what, I want to know what's going on to make sure my deployment uh, throughout the city is correct. But also after I make those rounds of violence, I go to every one of the bars and pubs within our city. Uh, we have a regular routine of going to uh, Federal Hill, Fells Point, uh, all the clubs in the downtown area. I actually go into these places. Uh, what I saw, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. What I saw when I first got here in uh, a lot of the citizen complaints is that uh, we had blocked off the streets, uh, down at cross streets. The young people were in the streets. Uh, it looked like we had a lot of over-serving. I saw young girls, uh, and I say young girls, 19, well, they should be older than that. Young girls who are 20, 21, but they, they look very youthful, who are intoxicated, you know, stumbling down the streets. And all those things uh, disturbed me. Um, I didn't think my officers were being as assertive as, as they should have been. Um, uh, we had guys out there who had been doing the same overtime uh, assignments for years, and so they became too comfortable. Uh, what I did is I changed that up. And I wanted uh, officers who uh, proved that they were good out there, that they wanted to be out there. They're the ones that got to work out there. I told Ian as he stepped into that what my expectations were. Uh, when I go out there, I talk to the doorman, uh, make sure that we have ingress and egress on those sidewalks, make sure they have people in line. I go in there and I specifically, I'm looking for capacity and seeing how people, how many people that they have. I pay attention and I actually look at the bar and I see if there's people under age and if there's people under age, I personally ask my staff to start carding people because I want the, them to know that we're going to hold them accountable. And I look and see if they're over-serving patrons that, that are taking place out there. Uh, I've seen a significant and a marked difference. I also told Ian that uh, I didn't want to do warnings. I wanted citations out there. If you see people who are doing something wrong, I wanted to set the tone that you just don't come to Baltimore and that this is the Wild West, you get to do anything that you want, that these are neighborhoods, these are communities, these are places where we live and you will respect the places here. Now we want people, and the mayor's made it very clear, we want people to come to our community, we want people to come out and, and, and participate in our parts of our community, but you will not tear our community apart. And that is the stance and that's the line and that's the direction I gave Ian. Why don't you share a little bit of what you've been seeing from an operational standpoint? Yeah, as, as Eric Costello mentioned, we started a citation initiative late last summer. Um, that, state, that citation initiative has continued um, every weekend since then. Uh, many of the officers in, sitting in this room uh, are participating in that initiative every Friday and Saturday night. Um, you'll have six officers specifically dedicated to the bar areas. Um, without those officers, you know as well as I do, it gets out of control. And um, those officers need to be focused on the area, and they are. They're writing citations regularly. Um, and uh, that, those citations are, are for quality of life issues, open, open containers, urinating, um, disorderly conduct. Um, and I'm seeing a, a steady flow of those citations every week um, when, I, when I count up the stats um, on, the, on Monday mornings. Um, and uh, that will continue. We, we put bike officers out there. They're not out there every night. Um, but they certainly are out there um, during the, the, the hours that these uh, bars are open on the weekends. Our, our level of communication between the, the community associations and the hospitality associations has increased. Um, we're, we're able to solve problems by communicating. Um, there was a period of time uh, in 2012 and tw early 2013 where the two associations were we're kind of at each other's throats on a regular basis. I think we've been able to work together to some extent to solve some of these problems. Um, we're gonna continue with that effort. Um, as the commissioner mentioned um, in the past, uh, there was problems, there, w w there was a perception in the community the same officers worked this, this detail every weekend and they became to, it, it looked like from the outside perspective that the officers um, were building relationships and actually working for the bars. We immediately put an end to that. We put the, the, um, the bar initiatives 
um, under new leadership. We changed out the officers that were creating that perception. And now it, it, it's crystal clear the officers are working for the citizens of the city. They're enforcing the laws and they have no allegiance to any specific establishment. Um, our community complaints, um, the, the biggest thing that I'm happy with is our community complaints are down significantly. Obviously, there's still work to do. Obviously, there's still people that, that um, get ridiculously intoxicated and cause problems. Um, but now there, there's, a, there's a plan in place and that plan seems to be working. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Chief, I don't know if you had anything to add as far as the capacity issue. Christian, do you give the As uh, Chief Niles comes up, you know, anytime we've called the fire department, there are our partners. So when we go into or when I go into those bars and we have overcrowding, we call the fire department out. They come out immediately and uh, they uh, do their inspection. And we've shut down facilities, shut down locations. Chief Niles. Basically, I was going to. Do the pimp I'm risk. sorry. I it's apologize. Glad it's night, all that. But, uh, it, and it's been twofold effort. It's been an effort where, just as you and I, when we email our communications, when you do have a concern, we send people out. But also, there's times that, that the commissioner has an issue with certain areas, and we all go out because of that. So if, if there's something you have a concern with or any other uh, citizen, please let us know. Uh, we we want to we put it on our radar. Am I Gladys Knight or are you the pips? I'll that. Okay. <laughs> I have one. I think I'm next. Good yes, evening, everyone. South Baltimore's in the house. Hey, here. <laughs> I just wanted to thank the mayor and the commissioner, as well as our new major, for having this gathering this evening. But I want to let you know how important this presence is. I brought with me some of my community. Would the young men of the community please stand? They're part of our green team. And We also have a parent of two of the young men with us. Uh -huh. And one of our seasoned seniors, uh, Sister Mamie, and one of the board members of the South Baltimore Partnership. We're doing community engagement, Mayor, and we were among the first group to arrive with our delicious seafood salad. Please try to get some. But we've also had an opportunity to talk with the then captain and now major. One of our concerns in the communities is the lack of attention. We're right next to Federal Hill, and we see police officers in that area often. We had the captain um, Daniels, if I'm saying his last name correctly, Don Walters, come out to our last community meeting. He gave us some insight. The issue for us, it is a matter of quality of life that we understand from that captain that the Bar Association pays for that overtime. And my deduction from that statement is, can we leverage some of the on-staff officers in the uh, Sharp Latin Hall area? One of the issues that come up for us is the rowdiness of those patrons coming from the bars. We work really hard in keeping our community clean and green with these young people, and we plant beautiful flowers. But we're witnessing, and that's why a lot of our kids don't come out at night, we're witnessing all sorts of rude behavior. And I think the presence of a patrolman would definitely show that um, that kind of behavior would not be tolerated. And Gus, thanks so much for recognizing me. I, I, hear, I hear you, and I'm looking at Ian, so he knows I give him given the eye that we're going to pay attention to that. Um, I've been in your area also. I know exactly what you're talking about. And uh, uh, probably because uh, I am in the area, I'm one of your neighbors, so I'm over in this area all the time. So I see the things that you're talking about. So we're going to pay very careful attention to it. And uh, I'm going to go out there and take a look myself. So I'll see what's going on. And before we go to the lady in the blue, I'm going to ask if Miss Keisha Allen would share. Miss Justin, Justin Finn, if you're putting that on your Twitter, don't tell people I live in the area, okay? <laughs> Got that? I see you, Justin. <laughs> Hi, I'm Keisha Allen. My concern is public enemy number one alert. Sometimes I think it's underutilized or there's a delay. We had an incident in my neighborhood last September where we had someone who slit his girlfriend's throat and no one really knew what happened. And I think it took about two weeks after the fact and that was because a news reporter came through the neighborhood. I just would like to see it used consistently and more often. I mean, when it's used, it seems that you all catch the person right away. I just like to see it 
happen more consistently. So I guess that's more of a comment versus a question. Thank you. Thank you so very, thank you so very much, ma'am. Uh, public enemy was uh, an interesting uh, concept of how we came about that. Uh, some people would say that it's a public relations uh, ploy that the, the police department is just doing it, which is not the case. Uh, last summer, we had a uh, young man who shot uh, a 19-year-old, uh, and I say child, but a young lady because my kids are much older than that, um, just because she had an argument with another female over in a, in a, in a northeast district and ended up shooting her on, on, her, on, her, on her front porch. And it so outraged me that uh, we needed to capture this guy. Um, he, if you remember him, he had a tattoo, I believe it was an L, right in the middle of his forehead, and a pronounced, for, uh, pronounced nose that you could see him very easily. So as we, the mayor and I have talked about, we talked about getting the community involved into the crime fight. And so we took that and we said, let's, let's put it out to the community. I mean, the community has to be upset about having this young lady have her life taken. And this guy had, I believe he had like three attempted murders on other people, on human life prior to this one. And he's walking the streets of Baltimore. So it so outraged me and angered me that we put that out as public enemy to track this guy down. And the community stepped up, all parts of the community. People started calling. People got involved. We put the information that's out there. And then we had uh, two or three others that, that came out the, the same way. Um, what, we were, what we didn't want to do is overdo it. And we're, what we're looking for is when we have those, like you were mentioning with this case, those very egregious cases, which are just so far out of line, uh, that we need the help of the public. And so that's what we're doing. We're waiting not to do it um, just to be doing it. Then it will become a public relations ploy. But we're, we're waiting for those very egregious people that we have difficulty tracking down. And one, one thing I have to say about this organization, it's extremely good at tracking down bad guys. They do a very good job of tracking down bad guys. And even the ones that we did public enemy, those are those not ploys. Those guys went after these people. My guys were hungry for them. And I think that they ended up finding that, that one guy in Louisiana. We found another guy, I believe, in Georgia. Uh, and then this other guy that you're talking about also had uh, done uh, an egregious crime in Detroit, too, if I remember correctly. So Ohio. So he, thank you for no, I appreciate that. All right. You're being Gladys Knight in a pimp, too, over here. Okay. <laughs> But uh, he had did it in Ohio, but we tracked him down with the help of the community also. So we will use it. We just don't want to overdo it. I'm sorry, Madam Mayor. No, I, I just wanted to add to that. One, one of the things that uh, was important to me to try to take advantage of the, uh, the fact that we are getting more information from the community is trying to find ways to create incentives to keep that information coming. So one of, the, one of the things that we did in this year's budget was increase the Metro Crime Stoppers. Um, rewards for turning in someone uh, that that leads to a gun arrest. Um, so, you know, I, I think we are the, the the tide is turning as far as the, the stop snitching culture. Uh, but I I know you know it would be an incentive for me if somebody said you know that you have you can get a thousand dollars for turning in somebody that has illegal guns. I wish I had some, knew somebody. I don't think I can qualify for it though. But I would in a in a hot second. Um, you know, that would be enough uh, incentive uh, for me. So hopefully, you know, we're getting the word out uh, about the increased uh, reward money, uh, and it will help spur what we've already seen is a, a increased inclination of the community members to come and, and, and give us that information. And uh, as the mayor was talking about Twitter, our numbers have, as she said, has gone up dramatically. The citizens are getting involved, and they know we're responding. We're doing it, we're coming out with one in the very near future on auto theft because that, that's becoming such a severe issue for us within the city. And I think what it has at the bottom is a $2,000 reward. So if people start identifying the people who are still in the cars and we think they're recidivists that are going out, that uh, we're going to put out a Metro Crime Stoppers and we're going to find the people who are impacting our, our community that way also. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And before you ask your question, if Tom, if my watch is correct, I have eight 40 or 839, and we do have a presentation. Is Butterbean still here, uh, Demetrius? Oh, and Butterbean will be making a presentation uh, to the explorers at, at the very end. So I just wanted everyone to know we're wrapping it up with the questions. Please raise your hand. We'll try to get to you as quickly as possible. Uh, yes, ma'am. Introduce yourself. And yes. Uh, good afternoon. I have more of a statement. My name is Noel Cherubim. I am a clinical research recruiter here with the National Aging Institute, an extension of the NIH. This is my second week uh, in Baltimore, and I just recently moved here. And 
My purpose for being here today was really to learn about the community and get more involved. We are really reaching out to the community to get involved and to participate in a lot of different events. And I'm really honored to be here that the mayor is here and the commissioner is here. And my statement really is to find out exactly how to get involved with all of the communities here and all of the leaders and the representatives and to find out exactly how we could improve our, the health of individuals uh, within our community. Because right now, Baltimore is my community as well. We are at the MedStar Harbor Hospital. Thank you. Thank you. There was a hand up. It was a gentleman. Yes, sir. And back here in the back, Larry. Thank you. A uh, question for the commissioner and for the mayor to hear. Um, I'm a resident of the uh, Hollands Market neighborhood. Um, some of the fellow residents of my block are here. And I know the others would like to be as well. It has been a rough time on our block. It's the 100 block of South Arlington. Every officer in this room knows it well. Dispatchers know it well. The district or the, the district station knows it well when I call. Um, forgive me because there's a lot of frustration behind this. Um, we have watched for a year and a half to two years as small crimes developed into a shooting three weeks ago and major crimes and a major heroin ring. Um, what I'm looking for from you is some advice and this question is basically how do we stay involved and trust that you're going to do what you say you're going to do when every neighbor and every resident in this community is calling the police, calling 911, sometimes not having 911 ever show up. And we have cars coming from all over the city, all over the state, for basically an open air drug market on our streets, around the corners, and it goes from block to block. I just, uh, Commissioner, forgive me for putting you on the spot, but I did hear you say regarding the bars in Federal Hill, you will not have people come to Baltimore to make it the Wild West and allow just everything to happen. How can you allow that happen with the drug trade over a year and a half and then it escalates into something like this? Thank you for the questions and, and your statements. I think part, part of the reason that we're here is to hear and to listen and to also respond. I think the bottom line is not to um, uh, say what we're going to do, but just to get it done overall. Uh, what you may not have, done, not have seen over the last year and a half to two years are the major arrests that we've made in drug markets throughout the, the community as a whole and th throughout uh, uh, Baltimore as a whole. We started it in the Western. We made large arrests, I think, of uh, 20 to 25 drug dealers that we uh, kind of uh, brought that to his knees in Ruxton. We then went to the Eastern. We are bringing, we brought uh, at the Lower Oliver community. We brought about 30 people down uh, to their knees. We were recently in Pigtown where we made another 15 to 20 arrests uh, over there at the same time. Um, in this area, you're going to see probably in the very near future another major arrest that's going to take place that we've been working. So to say that we haven't been doing something is not true. We've been making large arrests. We're putting pretty close to 100 to 200 bodies in jail in a short amount of time, and we continue to do that. Uh, we're doing every 30 to 45 day uh, operations that are taking place in different parts in the city. And like I said right now, uh, in this area, you're going to see in a short amount of time. What we're going to have uh, the major do is stand up and talk, tell a little bit about there, make sure that he makes contact with you, and that uh, we respond back to your neighborhood. Major. And while uh, the major's getting up, I, I do want to say is, it, is, it is clear until uh, we get it under control, Yes, we're, we're making a lot of progress, but you know, the, the part of, as the commissioner said, part of why we're doing these uh, kinds of conversations is to figure out those blind spots and the areas where uh, we, we have areas of improvement, and this is clearly one of them. Major? Um, we're well aware of Holland's Market in Sector 3, drug, the drug situation in Sector 3 is um, outrageous. There's no other way to put it. Um, I actually personally back in 2003, 2004 uh, was an undercover officer in the area and personally purchased drugs right at Holland's Market um, hundred, literally hundreds of times. Um, would, would walk right next to the market, get in line about 50 deep and just wait to get served. Um, it's not that bad anymore, but it's still outrageously bad. Um, our the Southern District, you might not know this, um, leads the city of all nine districts in, in drug arrests. We're going to continue to arrest not only the, 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 the drug dealers, but the, but the drug buyers, the ones that are also breaking into cars and breaking into houses that hang around the rehab clinics and um, 
some of them are legitimately there, but you know as well as I do, other ones are there to get free Suboxins to sell on the, as soon as they leave the, the clinic. Um, so we're going to continue to fight that fight, the, the, the fight that, that our officers make. Lieutenant Carter Bay has, has one of the best shifts in the city, if not the best. They're just constantly, day after day, for example, just two or three hours earlier today, um, our operations team chased down a kid at Lombard and Stockton, right around the corner, um, with 30 pieces of heroin. Um, he um, immediately uh, began to um, tell detectives he knows about other violent crime in the neighborhood, so hopefully that will lead to some violent crime closure. Um, so the bottom line is we're fighting for you. We, we, we truly are. Um, my bosses have been gracious enough to give me more resources. Like I said, in the next three weeks, you're going to see a marked increase of police presence in those neighborhoods. In fact, I got in touch with the special operations commander just yesterday, and I told him, look, we need help east because they were deployed more over towards Pratt and Payson. Um, they're going to still be deployed there, but they're going to expand towards the area of Highlands Market, towards the area of Arlington Avenue, um, towards the area of, you know as well as I do, Lombard and Stockton, Pratt and Cary, uh, Calhoun Street and, and, and Pratt, um, and, and extend it all the way down towards into um, Montclair area, uh, Ramsey and um, Wilkins, Ave w Wilkins and Mount. Um, so you know the drug shops, we, we certainly know the shops keep calling 911. Um, all that stuff gets tracked. He keeps me accountable for what we're doing about some of the largest calls for service drug areas in the city. Um, so it is important. You might not see the officer come immediately because compared to other crime, it is sometimes a lower priority. Um, but that stuff does get tracked um, and we are making arrests on a, on, a, on a regular basis. That area of the Southern District Southern District leads the city in drug arrests, but that area of the Southern District is our biggest area of drug arrests. So we are we are fighting. We are fighting for you. Um, have we solved the problem? Absolutely not. Um, so we're going to look at other plans. One of those plans is going to, like I said, take effect Monday, where you'll see for at least three weeks a marked increase of presence in the area. So the presence will hopefully deter some of it, plus it'll have more officers available to actually um, arrest some of the perpetrators. Now, what I walk away with that <clears throat> is that we are responding, we are doing something, but there's a bigger issue there. Uh, what Ian said, as you were saying, that in, this has happened in the last year and a half, two years, and Ian said this has been going on for the last 10 years. So that area has been impacted for the last 10 years, and, it, and it's been uh, causing an issue. What I bring to the table, and I ask the questions uh, as we move forward, is the question becomes, what's driving it? What's the causative factors that are the root cause of why it's been there for 10 straight years in this area? Although it's diminished, but it's still there. So part of the conversation that we will start having is what can we do to eradicate the problem long range? Is it drug dealers living in houses over there? Uh, is it absentee landlords living over there? I don't know the problem. I, I see heads shaking. I don't know the problem, but I will come up to speed on the problem to find out what's going on and make sure that we support Ian in uh, his battle out there. We do have those, co those covert operations that I shared where we're taking off 20 bodies, we're taking off 30 bodies. What we've seen is where we've done that within the city, we've eradicated the problem. The problem is gone and it doesn't come back because we're putting those people in jail. So what we're looking to do is just not take off one or two people. We're looking to take and deconstruct the structure and take all the people that are connected in there and take them to jail. Um, and hopefully we won't have the same conversation 10 years from the day and say this place is the same location, but start looking at really the root cause of what's ca happening over there. And can we do something different in a different way? Because if we keep running our heads into walls and we keep getting the same results, that's not what I want to do. I want to do something a little different. And we need to bring the community involved and have a conversation and say, what can we do differently to address this problem after we're making these arrests? So we're trying to move forward on that direction. And I put a young man in a position that people I'm promoting now, are those people who are very creative and think outside the box. And Ian's very good at that, so we'll be moving forward on that conversation. Thank you, sir. When we come back next year, you'll clap a little louder, so hopefully we see the results. Yes, sir. Good night. Uh, my name is Anthony Springhouse from the Brooklyn um, and Curtis Bay area. And my question is based on a belief I have, a life that I, I live. I think if the moral of the community, the youths would change, like manners and respect, we treating each other like neighbors, not being judgmental, because one thing I noticed, from going to the community meetings for a year that they say 90% of the 
um, drug in investigations that started in the Southern District is based on call-ins. Majority of them call-ins do not give accurate information. So there's a lot of brothers be um, harassed, and even kids and business people have a little tendency to look down at the police based on the things we saw in the past. I believe that if the morals have changed, if we have programs and strategies that's come together, so we all, the businesses, the studios, the libraries, like some of my friends is in here today, the pastors, the different organizations in our communities, like the Boys and Girls Club that I reached out to, if we work together, they won't be doing no crime unless they're persons that's really criminals. The ones that's really hard set on doing evil and drug trade and murder and all that stuff. But the majority of the violence in our community is based on misunderstandings, based on not opportunities and stuff. So we work together, all of that will be done based on my behalf. And I've been to prison and I know a lot and I'm influenced. I have a lot of influence and I'm telling you, that's the change. The morals of the people, you know what I'm saying? Have a nice night. So thank thank you, you very much for, for coming. And you know, that's what this is about. You know, this is um, my attempt to do something different uh, instead of waiting until there's a, there's a major problem and then trying to put out a fire. Um, but to, to have an ongoing conversation with the people that we serve to try to figure out how we can work together uh, better. I think um, you know, the, the statistics speak for themselves when it comes to the progress that we've made. That being said, uh, I'm still not satisfied, and I think that there are things that we can do uh, together to, to make things better. And uh, it, is, it is in that spirit that, um, you know, that I'm uh, proud that you're, you're still here at this, at this time of night, that we can try to find ways to work together better. Thanks. Thank and, you, Madam. And I like, can I jump yes, in? Sir. I like yes, to, sir. Uh, um, with your comments, I think you're right on. I think uh, in, in some of the communities where we're having an impact, and whether we have uh, children who are uh, acting out in, in violent ways, it is a moral, it is a standard, it is a, it is a value system that you say that you don't take a human life, that that's, that's an important, uh, important to address. And maybe we can't change people who are already at that, at that place, but one of the meetings that we had uh, the pr uh, previous week, we started talking about young kids before they reach that point. We started talking about the four-year-olds, the five-year-olds, and six-year-olds, because these kids didn't come out at 17 years old, 18 years old like that. They started at a, at a young level. And we would hope and we would wish that parents would make an impact, but uh, we have young people who are having babies. We have people who are 15, 16, 14 years old who are having kids themselves, which are starting to cycle all over again. And this is one of the things that when we talk about what can we do to make a difference, you know, uh, we're, we're up here and we're listening to what we can do as the government to make a difference in the community. But the community can help too in this battle too. And I, I would never ask you to try to go out and make an impact with a 17-year-old, 18-year-old, and that may, may be something that's fearful for you. I say this, and it sounds overly simplistic, but here's the reality. If a kid doesn't know how to read by the third grade, they're most likely 90% probability they will not graduate from high school. That's dramatic. If they cannot graduate from high school and they cannot get anything but a minimum wage job, who are they going to come in contact? They're going to come, come in contact with people like me who wear this uniform. So if we would make, wanted to make a difference for the future of this city where we can make a, a dramatic impact, how about mentoring kids at a young age before they get into that cycle and they can't get out? And I know some people, I may be to, uh, preaching to the choir, but I say that because of this. I didn't grow up here in this community, and I always apologize for not going to Dunbar or Digital Harbor or Poly, and I didn't graduate from those high schools. But, or, or were you Western? Yes. But uh, what, is it Western or West End? Western. But here, here's, here's the point that I'm making. I grew up in some very tough neighborhoods. I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. But what made a difference was having mentors. And, and some of those mentors wore uniforms. And so from that impact and that contact with me at a very young age, it has made a difference to me now at 54 years of age. You can make a difference. These kids may not look like you. They may not speak like you. They may not listen to the same music that you listen to. But you can make a difference in these young lives out here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And because of time, and Madam Mayor, I think if I can quote you, this time of night, <laughs> we have one last question, and we have, where's the officer who had the announcement? Oh, no, 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 uh, Sergeant wanted to make an announcement about, we're going to go with, and I'm sorry, Jane, the, the uh, poster here, I didn't see you, and when I finally saw you, Jane Bukeri, 
uh, from Holland's Roundhouse has a question. I, I really don't have a question. It's oh, more of a statement. Sure. Um, you've heard from a couple of young couples who live in the Holland's Market area. They recently invested by buying a house. Um, a lot of our problem, although they mentioned the heroin, a lot of it is the legal drugs. It's the abuse that are being sold on the street every day. You can drive. You can, the other night I was going to our community meeting to set up, and I'm sitting at the corner of Arlington and Pratt, and there's a gentleman yelling, Hey, John, hey, John, Buttes, Buttes, I've got Buttes. Do you want Buttes? So I would love to work with you on meeting with these institutions of what their impact to our neighborhood is. I mean, we're collecting the packaging for Buttes that are on the street. We've had people who have found needles laying on the street. So, I mean, I'm volunteering, if you need my help, to meet with them and just let them know just what goes on in the quality of life issues I mean, Joshua the other night was mentioning on the warm night, they tried to open their window to get air. Six o'clock in the morning, they're under their window screaming, buttes, buttes, buttes. So again, we are more than willing to work with you on these issues. And the major has done, has tried to do everything he can, but he, they can't be there 24 seven, and we know that. So we're willing to work with you. I appreciate that, and we'll definitely take you up on it. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm a witness that Jane will volunteer and diligently serve the community. Sergeant, and then we have a presentation to the explorers, and we're done. Well, we're finished. I'll hand it over to the mayor and commissioner. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sergeant Robinson. I supervise the neighborhood services team at the Southern District. We welcome all of you for being here. We want to let you guys know about a program that we're implementing. We have a lot of stolen autos and larceny from autos here within the Southern District. We have partnered with the state police. It's a program called Watch Your, Watch Your Car Program. It's a voluntary registration program that's designed to deter auto thefts, thefts and autos, and also assist in the apprehension of car thieves. The vehicle owner is actually going to sign an agreement which states that their vehicle is not normally used between the hours of 0100 and 0500 in the morning hours. We're going to be having that registration here at the Southern District. We're actually going to place those decals on your cars. So that's another effort that we're working towards in the Southern District toward reducing larceny from autos and stolen autos. So at your community meetings, my NSU team, which consists of Kevin Vault, Dina Roney, David Milburn, and Jerry Roney, they're gonna be coming out to your communities, letting you guys know when we're gonna have that event. And we encourage all of you guys to participate in that. And it's also going to help fuel the stolen autos here within the Southern District. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. And there is information here with us as a resource. We have information flyers or something. They can, folks can ask questions. They can come see one of you tonight. Great. Butter Bean, it's yours. Presentation to the explorers. And we'll hand it over to the mayor. Right, Pete. I received a letter today. Of course, uh, y'all know that we're practicing to go to Indiana this summer for the National Law Enforcement Explorers Conference. We've been training and training hard. Saturday, we'll be back at it. We're going to be doing some car stops and different other things. They love driving the cars. I'm telling you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so, in order to do that, it's five hundred dollars a child or a young adult. Excuse Thank you. Me, uh, in order to go, and that's just getting in the door. What we're doing is getting new uniforms for the kids, new equipment, and it's very costly. So we've been putting out on our Facebook and our web page and everything. A lot of people have gone to the web page and donated quite a lot, and we're very thankful for everything. Um, I got a letter today, and, and Mr. Brian McComas was here earlier, and he's in charge of Federal Hill Hospitality Association and Riley's. Uh, also, Abbey Burger Bistro, Blue Agave, CNR Pub, Mad River, McGurk's Mother's Grill, Rope Walk, Riley's, and Social Pub and Pie. 
It says, it is once again our pleasure to support the Baltimore Police Southern District Explorer Post 9449. We commend your personal commitment to the youth involved and your dedication to the Federal Hill and South Baltimore community at large. Please find the enclosed donations of $4,750 from the following uh, Fed Hill Hospitality people. So, we're going to Indiana. All right. And we're going to look good doing it. And uh, my sergeant is going to be our female adult advisor that's going with us. She's got to keep an eye on Martin and myself. <laughs> we have two young people here, and I can have uh, Lieutenant Brandon uh, May step up here, and uh, Sergeant Kaya Harris. Come up here. I remember your name. <laughs> whenever we call, whenever we need something done, they do it. Martin and I are just advisors. And we have given the reins to these guys to notify their fellow explorers of upcoming events, to keep on top of things, and to run the show. They made it incredibly easy for Martin and I. Except I have a <laughs> contract with Excedrin now, but that's the story. <laughs> but so Martin and I would like to uh, promote these two tonight, and that will be Captain Brandon May. And Lieutenant Kaya Harris. All right. Yeah. yeah. And if you need anything in your neighborhoods, give me a call. We'll be there. Thank you and good night. Well, before uh, Butterbean takes off, remember I, what my, my little uh, speech was about mentoring? Yep. I was a police explorer, and it was uh, a police officer who made that impact on my life as a police explorer. Give Butterbean a round of applause because he's yeah. making that impact. Yeah. Yeah. Well I can't do it myself. I got my partner, Martin Rump here. And Mark, too. Job well done, gentlemen. Thank you so very much. And uh, is it Captain and Lieutenant now? Congratulations. I'm very proud of you guys. Job well done. Thank you so very much. And Kaya Harris is also our Explorer of the Year. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, ma'am. It is. So I, I'll be very quick. I just want to thank you all again for coming out. I want to particularly thank the uh, City Council Vice President Ed Reisinger for being here the entire time. I'm, I'm again so grateful for your uh, for your commitment and for your partnership and all of the the community association leaders and Jack. Thank you for letting us co-opt your CRC uh, meeting for this uh, very meaningful uh, discussion. It was uh, certainly. Um, it, impactful for me. I hope it was for those of you who uh, were able to stay and thank you again. Commissioner? Thank you, Madam Mayor. As I close real quick, I was told and I was given this uh, commercial. Uh, if you didn't have a chance to uh, uh, answer your questions today, we have, we're trying to get closer to the, the public and use social media. We have a Twitter town hall tomorrow at 1400 with uh, the Southern Division, the district. It's at 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock, I'm sorry, 1400, 2, 2 p.m. So uh, please go on your Twitter uh, to respond. We'll answer all your questions. And this, I wasn't told to say this, and, and usually I get myself in trouble, and I just, think, I just say things from my heart because I believe them and, and, and I mean them uh, honestly. You know, the mayor has a very tough job. And I, I go to these meetings with her, and I listen to these hardball questions that she gets all the time. And, you know, I'm at the stage of life at 54 years of age. I get to pick where I want to work. And I work for people who I, who I know truly have their heart in the right place. And I know that because I get to meet with her uh, behind scenes. And I've walked away from jobs when people, I don't believe that their heart's in the right place for this, their community and for the people that are there. She works diligently. She's out on Saturdays. She's picking up trash. And, I, and I'm not saying this because I'm trying to make points with her. I'm saying that she does a good job, and I truly believe in the things that she does. Thank you for coming out. God bless you. Appreciate it. Thank you. As you leave, I'll ask that those of you who completed your surveys, there's a table outside as you exit. If you would leave those surveys on the table, there's a box there. We'd appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your questions. Have a great night.